Hello everyone! Pahamar here with episode 7 of the Let's Mod Reboot. Uh, today's episode uh, was originally just going to be talking about uh, logging. However, in between the last episode and this episode, uh, a new version of Minecraft has been released, and with it we have a new version of uh, Minecraft Forge. As well, it's just like Christmas here, um, we've got some new functionality added to Minecraft Forge um, specifically, it was added by a gentleman known as Briefcase Speakers, uh, or B Speakers, and he has added a way to allow users to use a graphical user interface to change configuration files, as opposed to just only having to um, edit the files in a text editor. So this is actually a very nice step forward in terms of usability for end users uh, to configure how they want their, the mods to work. So I'm actually going to be showing you uh, Manalian's uh, tutorial on how to actually use this new feature that Briefcase Speakers has added to Forge. So we're actually going to cover three things in this video. I'm going to show you how to update your mods uh, as they are today uh, for Minecraft 1.7.2 and uh, we were on version Forge 1.1.2.1 uh, so I'm going to show you how to update uh, for the newest version of Minecraft and Forge. I will show you how to use the new configuration uh, features that Briefcase Speakers has uh, added to Minecraft Forge, and I will show you how to use the logging features that uh, I was intending to. So, why don't we get started? To get started, um, we will start with updating Minecraft. So, you can actually see in our build.gradle file here, and uh, just a bit of a house cleaning item, I can increase the size of the font here. I can't increase it on the left. So we're just going to have to deal with that the space that we're predominantly looking at is much larger. Um, and you might just need to full screen if you want to see the different files and whatnot here. All my code, uh, I try to push into GitHub uh, when the episodes go live. So also feel free to reference the code on GitHub as well. So with that out of the way, there's two lines in here that we actually pay attention to when it comes to uh, a Minecraft update, uh, and uh, there's only one line in here that we specifically need to worry about if it's a Forge update. So why don't we look at the Forge line first? So there's two version lines in this build.gradle. There's our version, and then there's the version of Forge that we're using here. So this uh, script here, when I uh, originally showed you guys this in the first um, build script video, um, this indicated the version of Forge we were using, and if we were actually to load up the Minecraft Forge uh, website, so files.minecraftforge.net, this is the downloads website, not their main website, you can actually see here they now have a section for Minecraft 1.7.10 and all the different uh, files available and versions of it available. So unlike the first time where we didn't have a version of Forge at all, it didn't have a build script at all, we only need to change this line in order to do the update. So let's have a look here. The latest version of Forge for 1.7.10 is this version right here, 10.13.0.1160. I'm just going to copy that. And I want you to note that it's for 1.7.10. The reason I want you to note that is because Minecraft Forge uses the combination of the version of Minecraft and its own version as its whole version string. So here we just need to change it and say that instead of for Minecraft 172, it's for Minecraft 1710, and that the version of Forge is 10.13.0.1160. So here we've told our build script, when you run, grab this version of Forge. The other thing we need to change in here, the second line, is our version line. So here you can see that we're saying our mod is for Minecraft 172 here. We're actually going to change this now and say it's for Minecraft 1710. I'm going to save this. I'm going to open up the terminal window. You can find it here in the bottom left. This is in IntelliJ. Uh, if you were using Eclipse, you could just load up a command prompt or a shell script, uh, shell window, terminal window, I should say, and you can actually just rerun these Gradle commands. So, the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to run Gradle W clean. What this is going to do is it's just going to clean out all the downloader dependencies it's, uh, that we have so far. 
and it's just going to make sure that when we do this update that we're not going to accidentally use an outdated uh, dependency. That doesn't take very long. Now we're going to run Gradle W setup decomp workspace. Very similar to the first time uh, we did this. Um, so what this task does is it uh, will rebuild or build for the first time, but rebuild if you've done it before, a new decompiled workspace for the particular version of uh, Minecraft and Forge you've specified, which we've specified right here. So this will take a little while, uh, just like it did the first time, because now it's going to download all the files for Minecraft uh, 1.7.10 and Forge, and then it's going to decompile it. So this will take some time. This will be um, how long it takes will depend on how powerful your CPU is. So we will be back in a moment when this is finished. OK, so the setup decomp workspace uh, has now completed successfully. And you see here it almost took four minutes for me. And if we scroll up, you can actually see all the different things it did. So uh, not too terribly different from before. Uh, and similar to before, now we are also going to rebuild the uh, IDE's workspace. So Gradle W space idea for me. This won't take very long. And we're done. A little bit longer than I expected, but we're done. If you click inside of here, you'll actually, um, IntelliJ will tell you, hey, things have um, changed. We reload the project. It'll do that. And there you go. In the terminal here, you can just type exit for it to go away. And if we were to run the Minecraft client, you will, you should see, uh, it successfully load up Minecraft 1.7.10. So let's just wait for it to finish loading up. And there we go. You can see Minecraft 1.7.10 using Forge 10.13.0.116. If we look at our mods, there we are. OK, so now that we've updated to Minecraft 1.7.10 uh, and we've updated the latest version of Forge, I'm now going to start showing you the new changes to uh, configuration uh, that uh, Briefcase Speakers has added. So just so people know, I'm actually going to be showing you, um, I'm going to be running through this practically uh, with um, Manalian.com uh, is where the tutorial is. Uh, I'm going to be running this through and showing you that. So. All credit uh, to Manalian. Uh, and a very important thing to show is this actually uh, does work with uh, Minecraft 172 as long as you're using build 1147 and uh, 1710, although this build number is incorrect. So, in the f last episode, uh, I showed you how to create this configuration object here. Uh, and actually, let's show you where it's loaded in again. So you can see that we load in this um, configuration file in the pre-init uh, event. And what it does is it will initialize this configuration file here. And it will load in a parameter. And it will create it if it doesn't exist already. So the big change here is that now this configuration object, it's only used locally in this method right here. There's no way to statically access it. Um, so that's the first thing we need to do, is we actually need to change this so that we can actually reference this configuration object outside of this method. So now what this method will do is it will initialize this object, which I can access statically outside of this method. I can access it throughout the code. So the rest of this stays the same. The next thing we need to worry about is now we need to, uh, now that we have this guy right here, is we need to make sure that, um, you know what, I should actually show you this too. So I'll point this out in the comments last time too, and this is also in my aliens example. Um, when it comes to the configuration.save, you can actually say if configuration dot has changed, 
then save. Um, so just a small thing, um, I'm sure this will make some people happy. Um, what this line here will do is it will detect if the configuration file that we've been modifying here, this configuration object we've been modifying here, if it has changed, only then save. If there has been no changes, don't save the file, don't make a, a change to the file. Um, this is useful in development. If you were to have the configuration that you're tinkering with open inside of another text editor, for example, Notepad++, uh, the text editor won't scream at you all the time saying, this file has changed, this file has changed. You don't need to worry about that. So that's an important thing for, uh, for some. So now that we've done that, we actually need to add our first event handler. And to do that, uh, and the reason for doing this is there is an event when a configuration is changed. Uh, so we actually want to listen to that event and we want to handle it when it comes up. So because we don't have a package in here that I would consider something I would stick my uh, event handlers in, I'm going to add a package called handler. And you know what? Maybe I should just move this configuration handler into handler. So why don't we do that? I am going to end. Uh, there's a there's an analog to this inside of uh, Eclipse, um, but for us in IntelliJ, what you do is you go to refact, you select the class, refactor, move, and you type the new package name or the package it should be moved into. So handler refactor that. There we go. Now we have our configuration handler inside of the handler package as opposed to the configuration package. So what I'm going to do is I'm now going to add a new method public void on configuration changed event. I'm going to have it take in a config changed event And I am going to add the, well, yes, it's this format now, subscribe event annotation to it. So what I'm doing here, and this is very similar to what we've done inside of our mod class here. So uh, here in the mod class, it's actually a special annota annota uh, annotation, pardon me, uh, because this is um, very special methods for the mod. Any other uh, events are generally subscribed to with subscribe event. So once again, it doesn't matter what the name of the method is. So it's a public void. I just happen to always like to name my uh, event handler methods with a on the name of the event. So config changed event on config changed event. Subscribe this. There we go. So what we need to do, and I'll load up the event here. You can see here that the data that is available in the config changed event is the mod ID for the mod that's been changed, the configuration ID that's changed, whether or not the world is running, and whether or not it requires a restart. We, in general, are only going to concern ourselves with the um, mod ID for right now. So if event mod ID equals ignores case reference dot mod ID once again here's another example is why it's nice to have a handy dandy reference class then we are going to want to resync configs and what does resyncing the configs mean resyncing the configs would mean rereading the configs from files so we're going to want to change this method here so let us see Okay, so we've identified that now we need to resync the configs, but right now we have this um, initialization method uh, for the configuration. So we're actually going to uh, change how this works here. So the init here is actually only going to create the configuration object. All this other stuff here we will worry about in a later method. So, I know it's going to be scary here, but we're actually going to delete all that. And I'm going to say if configuration is null, create 
And then I'm also going to, let's do it below this new method here. So public void load configurations, load configuration. So this is a, another public void method, and this is just going to load the configurations. So in here is where we're actually going to uh, load in those configs. So because I've deleted them from here, I'll put them up here. So I'm just going to call them private. Actually, you know what? Public static boolean test value equals false. And down here, low configuration, what we're just going to do is we are going to load test value from the configuration. So configuration dot get boolean. Okay, so configuration get boolean. Uh, the name of the value we called config value. It was in category configuration category general. It had the default value of false and the comment was this is an example configuration value. And here we will use that handy dandy configuration has changed. Then save it. And there we go. Okay, so now we are loading in the boolean value from the configuration, because we know that's what it is, and we are only saving the configuration file again if it has changed. So now that we have this, lo this uh, load configuration method to resync the uh, configurations, if there's a change detected, what I will do in my onConfigurationChanged event, if, it, if the event matches our mod, then I'm going to resync the configuration. So there we go. Next we need to set up our mods GUI factory. Uh, this is the piece that's responsible for loading up your configuration GUI. Uh, and it's actually it's it's pretty simple. So uh, once again I'm following the Manalian example which is incredible. So uh, all credit to Manalian. We will need to add ourselves a new uh, method here. So a new method, a new class, I should say. So uh, let's see, where do I want to put this class? Uh, it's kind of as a client method, I believe, but it does get used on both sides, I believe. Let's have a look. OK, for now, I'm just going to put it in the root of Let's Mod Reboot. I'm going to call it uh, mm, just GUI factory. It's going to implement imod GUI factory. Oh, and it is in the client package. So uh, it is complaining that uh, I need to implement some methods. So. I will implement those methods. And for those who are wondering how I did that in IntelliJ, I just hit Alt Enter and it offered me the autocomplete, uh, the autosolve. So I'll add those methods. And there we go. Uh, and the reason I actually put it in the root of Let's Mod Reboot um, rather than some other packages, I wanted to find out what uh, side it was used on. So here you can see it's always used in client. So I'm actually going to add a new package here called client inside a client, I'm going to add a GUI package, and I'm going to move the GUI factory into that package. There we go. Okay. So there's four methods that gets added here. Initialize, main config, GUI class, runtime GUI categories, and get handler for. Currently, only one of these methods is actually used. Uh, the others are unused at this time. There are plans. Uh, to have the functionality added in the future. But at this time, we only need to worry about um, this method right here, main config GUI class. So, okay. So this method, it will return the config GUI class um, that we are using for our config. 
um, which we will get into in a moment here. We will create that next. Uh, what we need to do though is we need to actually add this factory class into our mod declaration. And I'm actually going to put it in here in my reference class. So public static final string GUI factory class equals com pomar let's mod reboot client GUI GUI factory. So once again, the path for this um, is the package structure, which is com pomar let's mod reboot client GUI and then the name of the class GUI factory. So let's mod reboot here. We will just add another parameter to the declaration here. And it is called GUI factory. And it is equal to reference GUI factory class. So there we go. Next up, we need to add ourselves the config GUI class. So inside of this GUI package here, I'm going to add another class. I'm going to call it GUI config. And it extends GUI config. Is that going to be a naming problem? Yep, it is. Okay. I'm going to rename this class as uh, so mod GUI config. Okay. So for this, we just need to add a uh, constructor to it. Okay, guys. So I tried explaining this, um, and it actually ended up being more complicated to explain while I was writing it, so I thought it'd be better just to write it myself and then explain it after the fact. So this GUI config uh, class here defines um, what the GUI configuration page looks like for your mod. Um, this is the parent one that comes with FML. What you want to do is you want to extend it. You want to make sure it's a different name than the, uh, than the parent class, obviously. This class only contains a single constructor. Uh, it takes a GUI screen parameter. And inside of it, you only need to call uh, the super, so you want to call the parents constructor. And if we look at this particular one here, what this does is it takes the GUI screen object that comes into uh, this method here, so it takes that. Then it gathers a list of configuration elements. So to get that, uh, you actually grab the category in your configuration object, so this is the one you've defined. And you say, okay, for this configuration object, grab the category, blah, and get all child elements. So this will be all um, configuration parameters inside of the general category for this configuration object. You also then tell it the mod ID. Uh, which one was this? Yep, okay. So you tell it the mod ID next. Sorry, the parameters were out of order here. Uh, so in this case, it is, I just reference our mod ID. You then tell it if it requires a world restart, if something were to change, which is false. Uh, does it require a Minecraft restart? False. And then you want to grab the title for this configuration object. So for here, I'm just giving it uh, this parameter here, which is just a straight copy from the tutorial. So if we've done this properly, I'll load up Minecraft here. No errors so far, that's good. So if we were going to our mods here. Okay, I realized what I had done wrong here. Inside of our GUI factory, we need to return the class that we had just created. So get uh, so we are returning mod GUI config dot class. We will run this and see if we did it properly. So 
So to check, we'll go to mods, we'll click on our mod, and now we can see, unlike before, so before we were like this, we had a grayed out config button. Now we have this config button. If we click it, we can actually now see the uh, the parameter name, which is config value, and what the current value is. And I believe, yeah, so undo and reset to default. So I can change this to false. And now I can say, okay, I want to reset it back to what it was, or I can reset it back to the um, default value. Done. And now we've changed that value. If we were to close Minecraft and look at it, there it is. Okay. Now that is the new uh, graphical user interface configuration thing that uh, Briefcase Speakers added. Let's now look into the logging side of things. Okay, so now that we've done the uh, configuration GUI changes, let's move on to the logging thing that I promised uh, in the last episode. So uh, let's just close all of these for now. Go back to the project view and close that. Okay. So we have this idea of a utility package, but we have no utility classes inside of it yet. And the very first one that I always find myself going to is the idea of a logging utility class. Uh, the idea of a logging uh, utility class makes it, um, the usage of it, I should say, uh, it actually makes um, putting in your debug statements um, as you're trying to find out what's going on with your code very easy. Um, so I've been using one inside of my mods for some time and I will show you how it works. So um, in the utility package I'm going to add a new class and I will call it log helper. And this class will contain uh, several methods inside of it. So you know what I'm just actually going to copy and paste what I have from a code like exchange 3 because there's no sense in me typing it all out fix that import. Okay. So uh, I touched on in a previous episode the idea that Minecraft uses log4j2 for all of its logging and to give you an idea of what that is is when you actually look inside of um, the in IntelliJ in run you can actually see the contents of the log file. Um, and let's see where I can show you where to find it. So we'll go to Minecraft 1.7 log4j. So inside of your project um, wherever your um, instance is based out of that Eclipse run thing, um, you will notice inside of here a folder called logs, and inside of here is a whole bunch of logs. FML client latest, because we've only been doing the client, this will be the most recent log, and if you open it up, you will know, see all kinds of statements here. So you can see these debug and info statements, and that they're coming from FML. These are all FML uh, logging statements. What we're going to do is we're going to add our own logging to it. And that's where this stuff comes in. So log4j2 and log4j, um, the, the parent project that log4j2 came from, uh, have the idea of these log levels. And we'll go have a look here. So as the level gets higher, it gets more in depth. So if your logging level set to off, nothing will happen. Uh, fail means severe error that will prevent the application from continuing. Error means something's happened, but it's probably recoverable. Uh, warnings, information, debug, and trace, which is the most fine grain, and then there's all. The ones we generally care about are going to be uh, these ones. So fatal, error, warn, info, and debug. Although in my log helper, what I actually do is I, I implement a method for all of them. So let me explain how this code works. We have the idea of this method up here called log. It takes in a log level and an object. And this object would be uh, whatever you want outputted as the text in the log entry. So this could be a string or this could be a Java object, in which case it'll use the string value of that object. So if you wanted to do a debug line and just pass in an item, for example, it would output the items um, to string value. So what this guy does is it will actually put in a log entry in the FML logger identified to your mod at the appropriate level 
and the message. So each of these other methods in here, uh, so all debug error, etc., they just take in the message and they call this method at the appropriate log level. It's a very, very simple class. Why don't I show it to you guys in, uh, in effect? So let's go into Let's Mod Reboot and let's do this. So I'm going to do Let's Mod Helper Info uh, Pre Initialization Complete. Initialization complete. Post initialization complete. If I were to run this now, what will happen is each of these methods are called. It will input a new line into the log. So let's let Minecraft run in the background there because we're more concerned about this guy right in here. So. There we go, I see it. So in the previous episode, when we were putting a system dot out, we were actually just noticing something like this, just a basic line of text in there, no time, no idea, no idea what thread it came from, the log level where it came from. Now, you will notice here, we have this entry here. So we have an info line, pre-initialization complete. Then, if we come down a little early, a little later, we will find initialization complete and post initialization complete. Why this is really helpful is this will allow you in your in your mod anywhere you need to put in something that you want to show up in the log here. You can just add a single line with the message you want to put in at the appropriate level, and what it'll do is it will add that line to the main log file but you will actually be able to search on your mod ID. So this is going to be really helpful when uh, you're troubleshooting mods um, in the future. When you have users coming to you saying that this won't work or that won't work with all these other mods, you can actually filter out the messages that pertain to your mod only. So it's a very lightweight class. Um, I've seen a lot of people adapt it. I recommend you adapt it as well. So, uh, and by adapt it, I mean like use it in your projects. Don't have to make changes to it. But um, let me just show you this. Let me just quickly run this again. And I'll just put all kinds of different levels in here. Uh, you know what? Let's make this fatal. Come back to run. We'll stop and rerun it. We are running again, and here we go. So here is, oh yes, I remember this now, okay. So we're missing one here. We can find the warning, initialization complete, and fatal, post initialization, post -initialization complete. But we're not finding that uh, pre-initialization one, and we can just confirm it by doing the search. We're only finding the two. The reason for it comes from the idea, once again, of those log levels. So unseen here, and I may actually be able to find it in here. to these logging levels, there's this configuration file called log4j2, and it will say only log messages a certain level and up. Anything lower than it, don't log into the log. The out of the gate FML one is set to info, which means you'll get info, warn, error, fatal, and off. You won't get debug or trace. 
you can provide your own log for j2 configuration file um, if you want which will specify um, your own level so here you can see this is where it's set it's set to info if you want this to be at a, at a higher level if you want to see debug and trace you can copy this and then just change these files, uh, these entries here. This is a very advanced thing to do. Um, for the majority of the time, you probably will only just want to log at info and above. But just to explain, if you were to end up trying to use debug or trace or all, and they don't show up, it is because the default FML log for J2 only logs info and higher. So it only log these. Just to explain that. So. Um, that is an awful lot for a single episode uh, that we just covered updating Minecraft from 172 to 1710. Uh, I've showed you briefcase speakers, new edition of the graphical configuration object um, when it comes to your mods, as well as uh, explained, hopefully explained, the idea of a simple log helper class and uh, if you were to want to configure the different levels when it comes to logging. Um, I think for the majority of you out there, logging at info and higher is fine because info is literally just an informational post in there. Uh, debug is really low level as trace is even beyond low level. So next time we will be picking up with, uh, I believe it is our first item class. Uh, if it's not that one, it's the block one. Sorry, I don't have the, uh, the syllabus up in front of me. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed this episode and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks again.